Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Welcome, I'm Dr. Travis Hoffman, NDSU and University of Minnesota Extension Sheep Specialist. I'm providing a webinar today prior to our Central Dakota Ag Day, featured on December 3rd, 2020, and hosted virtually by our Carrington Research Extension Center. My talk today will aim at focusing on just a quick introduction on sheep or goats or both. Now we have options for producers, and those can be young producers or established people that want to continue to get involved in our livestock industry. One of those options to get involved in our livestock industry is to either begin with a species that is a little bit smaller and easier to manage, such as our small ruminants of either sheep and goats, or to diversify an existing operation that may have been swine, dairy, beef, maybe even equine focused, and shift and provide a little bit of diversification and alternatives to your livestock operation. One of the things to keep in mind, particularly in goat production, is that there's a diversity of products that we can produce. On our top left, we need to make a decision of whether we wanted to produce boar goats with an emphasis on meat and meat quantity and meat yield. The top right is an Angora goat that produces mohair. The bottom left is a Sonnen that produces primarily goat milk and our more common or nor native Spanish goats that can breed up particularly in any of the other directions as well. So in our sheep industry, we have three primary different focuses on breeds that I'll touch on uh, for today's lecture. And one of those is our wool breeds. And so an impact on providing a balance between meat and the lambs that are produced, but also providing a renewable resource uh, with the sustainability of wool that can be merchandised in our fashion industry and across many different options and our um, approach of either using those for next to skin, outer garments, and other possibilities. There's a focus on an increase of fast gaining animals. Those would be commonly and most commonly our Suffolk or our Hampshire. On the bottom right is a picture of our Dorset that also has plenty of quality and talent uh, relative to quick and efficient production. The other thing is we've had an increase in hair sheep breeds. And these also are potentially either the white dorper, uh, the dorper on the top left, or even royal white and katahdin used that are on the bottom. Uh, just an option that provides a, a chance for people to get involved if the shearing and the wool production is not a focus, uh, we can still have that option as well. Here's a quick picture of some lambs from a research project that we'd previously worked with, uh, and they weighed approximately 132 pounds as a group. Uh, but this is what a, a accumulation of the sheep in our area might look like. Some of them might be white-faced and predominantly wool breed. Some of them can be predominantly black-faced and predominantly meat breeds or a combination of those as well. Also with our more non-traditional market in both the sheep um, aspect and our goats, those can be offered for ethnic trade and be specifically popular during holidays. Now to provide just a quick approach here is that we're gonna talk about diversifying our livestock operations. And so these are photos courtesy of Dr. Allison Crane, previous PhD student at North Dakota State University, is now at Kansas State, and it shows a little bit of what, if you so choose to run some of those goats um, with the cattle or goats with the sheep, uh, there's gonna be some differences in terms of the preferences of forages that they consume. We have some advantages on being able to mesh and to work with those, or if it was to graze sheep with our cattle and our range cows, um, and so our sheep and goats could be up to one animal per each one of the cows and cows and calves, and not really have much of an impact relative to the forage production that we have and the forage that is utilized um, because they're gonna eat a little bit differently. And so that allows us the options to make improvements. Here's a, um, a picture from Sentinel Butte, North Dakota. And in fact, uh, this, as you can see in 1998, 
And then in 2000, on the right side um, of, of this uh, particular slide, shows some of the differences. Now, it's just a quick indication and looking at if we were to use sheep to help us to control leafy spurge. And so that's one of the options that we can use to have sheep go in and graze, get ahead of our cattle, and then to try to get rid of that from our pastures and so that we can have a better, more managed operation. With our intensive grazing, and here's an example of goats again, uh, but you can use this with sheep and different uh, paddocks. And so utilization of a smaller area of rangeland uh, and with the different fencing and electrical fencing in this standpoint of keeping them within their particular paddocks, moving them around and uh, being able to again utilize the grasses and forages that you do have. Not all the time will this uh, be the case. And in fact, some of the time we will have more of the farm flock or more enclosed locations. But I think when we're talking about differentiation and the diversification of our operations with either sheep and goats, it's important to consider that we're util utilizing the rangeland that we may have. Most of the goats uh, are in the are actually in Texas, and a lot of those uh, were historically fiber goats. We've made a shift more toward the boar goat and the more meat producing focus. But let's realize that there's also a lot of uh, goats that that are are both mohair producing, meat producing, and then the big cluster that's more so in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan are ones that would have the dairy as their primary products. Here's a USDA census map of a lot of our sheep and our sheep operations, just to give us an indication. We know that we have quite a few animals uh, in Texas, and that would be one of our lead locations. California has quite a bit of, uh, of animals as well, or in, at least previously in 2012. Interestingly, if you look at North Central Colorado, you'll see big bright um, dots there. That's where a large part of our feeding industry is in our feedlots and a couple of our larger lamb processing plants. In the upper Midwest, uh, there's more animals kind of as we move towards the southeast and south or in east central locations in South Dakota. Uh, bottom third or southern third of Minnesota has more. And truthfully, North Dakota uh, around our state, it's spread out a little bit more evenly uh, across the state with not large locations. Uh, except one larger feedlot here in the southeastern part of North Dakota. So to keep in mind, our sheep and goat supplements are, su are something that we can provide as well. I'll put this in there, and this one's focused on both goat mineral, uh, the mineral block that you could have, or even if you were to provide a premix. The important decisions, the important information to keep in mind is that goats do require some copper, um, and they require copper at a higher level uh, than sheep. Yes, sheep need uh, to have copper as part of their diet, but for the most part, supplementary copper can be more negative than positive. And in fact, if we have an overload relative to the amount of copper, uh, we can have some challenges and some deaths within our, our sheep. And so if you were to make a decision um, and to run them together, you'd be better off with sheep mineral um, than choosing the goat mineral if that was the case. Uh, but a uh, little bit of challenges there that we got to keep in mind as we differentiate uh, into our small ruminant species. Just a couple things to keep in mind here is that we would have potentially milk replacer uh, for either the lambs or the kids, uh, the bottles and uh, being able to tube those animals uh, so that we can keep those moving and moving forward with their um, production. Uh, a dehorner and elastrator and our rubber elastration bands can be used to decrease the horn incidence on our goats and to castrate unwanted production males. Uh, thermometer, clostridium perfringens C and D, and our injections can help us point in the right direction, but also we need to provide hoof trimming and making sure that we can trim those hooves um, because that's one of the things that we need to monitor for our sheep and goats and making sure that they are mobile, and that we don't have issues with potentially foot rot, foot scald, or other challenges uh, that can focus and hurt our production values. Additionally, predation can be a challenge and something to keep in mind as well within our sheep and goat 
industry. And if we're working with that, is that potentially guard dogs or llamas or uh, donkeys could potentially help us out. Um, but making certain that maybe we keep them in closer in the evenings can also be advantageous. Lastly here is that I wanted to touch just quickly on parasite control. And so we can be able to collect fecal egg counts from those animals. And then also there's a system called the FAMACHA system that looks at the inside of the eyelid. And here they open the eyelid on this particular goat, looked at the bottom eyelid, and you evaluate where that is. And the darker the red, the healthier they are in relation to parasitic load. Once you get past the, the three or C there of the medium and get into the light pink and, and even to the real light uh, pink, uh, we become challenges that those animals are anemic um, and we need to treat those animals, preferably on a case by case basis, but something needs to be accomplished so that we can be able to keep those animals thrifty and moving forward. One of our last slides here is we look at, again, incorporating either sheep or goats or both to our livestock operations is just a quick checklist. Some of the things that we need to keep in mind if we wish to differentiate it and uh, in our livestock operation, making sure that we have shelter and fencing. If the, certainly the goats, if, uh, if water can get through those fences, maybe the goat can as well. And we know that we wanna keep more shelter for them also, particularly when we're closer to parturition and keeping those baby lambs and baby kids alive and doing well. Bedding material is important during the winter. Collars and identification is having scrapey identification. Uh, primarily, you can choose other individual identification, but making sure that we have scrapey as an uh, scrapey ID and scrapey tags for, for those animals is a federal requirement. And then look at where you wanna be on your water and your feeder, your hay, your grain, your mineral for your feed resources. And then we already touched on just foot care, health care, medications, and then working with your veterinarian. And so we look forward to future discussion on December 3rd, 2020 through the Central Dakota Ag Day. And we'll have some discussions and uh, we will get the chance to determine how you can add either sheep or goats and add a little bit of variety and spice to your life and your livestock operations. And with that, I thank you and we will reconnect at a later point in time and have a great day. Um, and don't forget to eat lamb, wear wool and consume goat. Thank you so much.